What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Philly Sports Power Hour. It's Friday. It's opening day. It doesn't get much better to be a Philly sports fan right now. We got opening day for the fighting Phils. We got Joel Embiid probably coming back. The NBA, the Sixers, they teased it on their Twitter account. We got Ivan Fedotov in New Jersey today for a press conference with the Philadelphia Flyers. Are you kidding me? We'll get into that if you don't know who I am talking about or you don't know what I am talking about. Ivan Fedotov somehow is going to be playing for the Philadelphia Flyers this season in that 6-7 goaltender was arrested a year ago by Russia, so he, he had to do his military service. I don't know. But he was drafted in 2015 by the Fly Guys. It looked like he wasn't going to get here. He is here. We got the NFL draft coming up in a month. I love sports, man. This is why I love sports. It's an exciting time to be a Philly sports fan right now. But obviously, we're going to talk a lot today about opening day with the Phillies because it is exciting. I know we had to wait 24 hours, but we're here. So we'll get into that. We'll do a little Eagles talk today, but not as much as normal because it's opening day. But it's good to see everybody. Appreciate you spending this hour with me on the Philly Sports Power Hour. I know you got other options that you can do for your sports talk, so I do appreciate you being here with me and with us. So make sure you hit that like button, hit that share button. We're streaming live on YouTube. We're live on TikTok, Facebook, Twitter. We're everywhere. But let's get a little roll call in the chat. Let me see who we got in the house on this Baseball Friday. The fighting Phils are back. RJ Ramirez starting us off. Good morning. Got a question about the draft. We'll talk about it, RJ. Flexing and stepping, my man in the house. Rob at Temple in the house. Wine Niners Wine in the house, as always, my man. Appreciate you. Decoy Gaming says, Big Bills was running late. I'm never late, Decoy. I am never late. I'm always sitting here, 9.57. My producer just needed a minute to finish up Birds 365. That's all. Big Bills. Is never late. Who else we got? Twiz in the house. Steve Ike in the house. Mr. Rudy Poo. Man, Mr. Rudy Poo. You are a very negative human being, man. You are always negative. Who's losing tonight? You talking about the Phillies? Are you talking about the Sixers? Who's losing tonight, man? I see Jim Joyce t- checking in on TikTok. I see Tony Brand checking in on TikTok. Play ball is right. Appreciate it, flexing and stepping. The loyalty is appreciated. Who else we got here? Steve Patton. Cody Rose will win the WWE title this weekend in Philly. We got WrestleMania. I was at WrestleMania 15 when it was at the Wells Fargo Center. That was pretty cool. That was the WrestleMania where, do you remember they were doing that? I forget what they called it forget what they called it, but they were boxing and they were really boxing. And then they had the WWE wrestler at WrestleMania box Butterbean and Butterbean knocked him out within like three seconds, like legitimate knockout. They've never done that again. That was a bad move. Oh, so Mr. Rudy Pooh does not like the Phillies moves. We added wit and now we better shaking my head. Dude. This team went to the World Series two years ago, was a game away from the World Series last year. (laughs) So what did you want them to do? Completely overhaul the entire roster? They're a good freaking team, man. We'll talk about it, Mr. Rudy Pooh. Too negative, man. Too negative in the house today. Who else we got? Bridget Tobin in the house, literally and figuratively. She's actually here in the house right now. Probably downstairs in the gym. Good to see you. Crawley, who else we got here? So everybody hit that like button. Oh, man, Rudy Poo is all over it today, all over it. All right, let's jump in because Rudy Poo wants to talk about the fighting fills. We'll talk some Flyers. We'll talk some Sixers. We'll talk some Eagles. But let's start with the Philadelphia Phillies. So opening day today, 3 o'clock. 
Atlanta Braves. Zach Wheeler on the mound against Spencer Strider. And let's talk about Wheeler for a second because GM Matt Klintak really didn't do a lot when he was here. He really didn't do anything that great for this Philadelphia Phillies team. But signing Zach Wheeler December of 2019 was probably, I don't even know if it's probably, I think it's definitely the best move he made as general manager. The Mets, what were they thinking letting this guy out the door? And Klintak signs him to a five-year, $118 million deal. And you got, in 2021, he pitches the most innings in in all of Major League Baseball. Has close to 200 innings last year. But what he's done in the postseason over the last two seasons, he's pitched 63 innings. He's got an ERA of 242. Zach Wheeler, stud. And this is his first opening day start for the Phils. Usually it goes to Aaron Nola, but excited to see Zach Wheeler. But interesting, I just heard on the radio, everybody thought the first pitch today was going to be Fletcher Cox and Jason Kelsey. Well, I just heard on the radio that's actually going to be Saturday. That's going to be tomorrow. So we don't know. We don't know who the opening pitch is going to be. Who's going to throw out the first pitch today? All I heard on the radio just now was it's going to be very exciting and the place is going to go crazy. So we'll see who it is. So Kelsey and Cox have been pushed until Saturday. So that's a little disappointing. Yeah, I see flexing and stepping booing. Gary Williams on TikTok is happy we re-signed Wheeler, as am I. So now you're going to see, well, what happens now? Because I talked a little bit about this yesterday. I'm not concerned about Zach Wheeler this year. The guy's a true professional. He's going to be just a solid pitcher, knock on wood, absent injury. But the pitcher that I'm worried about is Aaron Nola. Because we've seen him have some up and down years. And I don't know, what do you think you're going to get? What do you think you're going to get from him now that he got the big deal? Now that he got his contract. So the question is, does he respond in a way where it's he's relaxed? Now that the contract's behind him, he's relaxed. He just goes out there and he pitches. Or does the opposite occur? Where now Nola thinks he needs to prove he's worthy of that contract with every single pitch in every single game and the pressure becomes too much. So for me, when I look at the pitching staff, I'm not worried about Wheeler. I'm definitely not worried about Ranger Suarez. We've learned now two postseasons in a row, Ranger's got ice in his freaking veins. And now he finally has a spring training with no issues, no injuries, no visa issues, no World Baseball Classic. Ranger Suarez should have a great season. I see people trying to guess in the chat as to who the opening, who's going to throw out the first pitch now on opening day. It's interesting. So I see Luke Skylifter says Charlie Manuel. Steve Patton saying, would it be Saquon Barkley? I don't think it's going to be another eagle. I don't think they would bring another eagle in. Because they're going to have Cox and Kelsey do it on Saturday. But it will be interesting. And on TikTok, Tony Brand saying Saquon Barkley. I don't know. I don't think they would do that. I don't think they would bring another eagle. In today. Daz says Orlando Scandrick. Yeah, okay. Definitely not going to be him. But what's Rudy Poo doing in the chat? Rudy Poo's being overly negative. So let's see what he's saying. TikTok, you can't see the, the comments on, on YouTube. But he says, we watched other contenders make moves while we're running it back with the same embarrassed bunch. And he's laughing. So let's look at this roster. Because, I mean, really, where... Where are they worse, though? You know, you can look up and down this lineup, and we talked about this yesterday. So, let's. Rudy Pooh says other teams improved and the Phillies didn't. Well, where did you want to see them improve? You got Kyle Schwarber at the DH. Real possibility of hitting 50 home runs this year. We're going to make some bold predictions shortly. But Schwarber, 47 home runs last year. Did you want to replace him at the DH? No. Shortstop. Batten second, Trey Turner. Are you going to replace Trey Turner 
Rudy Pooh at shortstop? No. Do you expect Trey Turner to have a better season than he did last year? Absolutely. Hopefully he doesn't have that long slump that he had. So you're not doing that. What do you want to do, Rudy Pooh? You want to replace Bryce Harper at first base? You want to take one of the best players in Major League Baseball? You replacing him? No. Well, what are you doing at third base? Alec Bohm batted 274 last year, took another step forward. I'm expecting even better things from Bohm. He hit 20 home runs, 97 RBIs last year. I think he adds to that power, has a real shot of hitting over 25 home runs, maybe even 30 home runs this season. So you're not replacing him. What are you doing with your second baseman? You, you trade in Bryson Stott? You getting rid of him? Who's going to bat maybe 300 this year? No. JT Ramuto, a catcher? No. Nick Castellanos at right field? Maybe you could make the argument you don't want Casty back. I mean, he was an all-star last year. Maybe you could make that argument. I wouldn't. I like Casty in right field. I like Brandon Marsh in left field. And I like Johan Rojas in center field. Now, if you're talking about pitching, if you're talking about pitching, well, you got Zach Wheeler, Aaron Nola, and Ranger Suarez. Could they have went and got Jordan Montgomery? Okay, I could get behind that. I could have gotten behind the Jordan Montgomery deal. But here's what I'm hoping is, is they're thinking here. And I see Rudy Poo saying they need another lefty bat off the bench, which I don't necessarily disagree with you on that either. However, what I had been saying when there was talks about them maybe getting Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery is if they don't make a move, I'm okay with it sitting around waiting until the trade deadline. Let's see what this team's holes are. Let's see what they need. I know they don't have a true closer. We talked about that yesterday. It's going to be a closer by committee with Alvarado and Sir Anthony and Hoffman and Soto, Strom, Kirkering when he comes back off IL. But let's see what the holes are. So for me, I'm okay with, hey, let's open up the season. They have a stacked roster. They really do. I mean, this lineup should be stacked. They have three really good starting pitchers in Nola, Wheeler, and Suarez. And then you look at that bullpen. I know we can make arguments about the bullpen, but I think it was Major League MLB.com ranked them as the number one bullpen in all of baseball. So, sure. Could we sit back here and say, hey, they need another lefty bat? Ah, they could use a, a better fourth starter instead of Tawan Walker or Christopher Sanchez. But you can't not be excited right now looking at this Phillies team running it back this year. So let's look at some of the odds. Let's look at some of the futures. So you got World Series odds. Phillies have the sixth best odds to win it all this season. The Dodgers are plus 350. The Braves are plus 450. Houston plus 750, Baltimore plus 1,100, the Yankees plus 1,100, and then the Phils plus 1,400, sixth best odds to win the World Series. Now they have the third best to win the National League behind the Dodgers and the Braves. So you got the Dodgers at plus 180, the Braves at plus 240, and then the fighting Phils at plus 750. So I see a lot of people talking about the back end of the bullpen. Talking about the closer position on TikTok, Gary Williams asking about who's our closer. Well, they don't have one, Gary. And that's one of the question marks is they want to go with a closer by committee approach. So they're not going to have a true closer, at least to start the season. Could somebody grow into that role? Possibly. But you look at it, they're going to go with a closer by committee. They're going to have Alvarado and Dominguez, Jeff Hoffman, Greg Soto, Matt Strom, Orion Kirkering when he gets back from IR, or I guess they call it IL in baseball. So we'll see. He wants to do, he wants to do a bunch of um, matchups. Thompson wants to do best matchups. They're not going to have a true closer. I tra I'm more of a traditionalist. I would like to see them have a true closer. That you know once you get to the ninth inning, you got a guy that can come in and shut it down. 
because I think there is a mentality there as a closer. So I think you need to have that mentality. It's a lot different in the ninth inning than it is in the seventh inning. And that was one thing my dad always said that he loved about baseball is it's the only sport where you can't run out the clock. It's the only sport where you have to get your outs. And I love football, love basketball, love hockey. But you get the lead, you can run out the clock. In baseball, no running out the clock. You have to get those outs. You have to throw the ball over the plate. So that's what's been pretty cool. But that's why I'm not a huge fan of the closer by committee. But we'll see how things shake out. And it's a long season. And when the trade deadline gets here, maybe, maybe they make a move for somebody. So we'll see. Yeah, John Russo agrees with me. Likes the roles for the bullpen. So do I. I like having the setup guy. Having the closer. See, you know, for me, too, it's, I think there's a mentality for your entire team where you know, hey, we get, we get through the seventh. We're turning things over to our setup man, then our closer. Well, you're not going to have that now. You don't know who's going to be coming out in the eighth, who's going to be coming out in the ninth. But I see Steven on TikTok saying he's glad Kimbrell's gone. So, do, so am I. Look, Kimbrell probably will be a Hall of Famer. He did some good things here in Philadelphia, but he was done. I was so sick and tired of seeing him last year, especially in October, when you knew when he got out there that things were going to go bad. And I knew as we talked about the closer, somebody was going to bring up Trevor Bauer. R.J. Ramirez says, hey, what about signing Trevor Bauer? I don't want him. Everything we hear about this Phillies team, everything you hear about this clubhouse is that it's one of the best clubhouses in baseball. These guys truly get along. They love each other. It's a great culture, all that. I don't know if you bring in a guy like Trevor Bauer and risk messing that up. So I don't really want him. So I know that people are going to say that, but for me, I'm all right. Sean on TikTok says the Braves will win the NL East. Michael Clark, the Dodgers are not going to win the World Series. Doesn't matter how many games you win, because people are saying they're going to win 120 games. So, I don't know. But yeah, I'm not... And I see Barbara Carroll saying Trevor Bauer is not a closer. I thought Bauer was the closer. No, am I wrong on that? Why did I think he was a closer? Or is he the starting pitcher? I'm getting confused. There's another guy out there that I thought people wanted to bring in as a closer. Yeah, no, why? I'm, I'm thinking of somebody else. I'm thinking of somebody else. Yeah, Trevor Power would be a starting pitcher in this rotation. My apologies. Thank you, Barbara Carroll. But even still, yeah, I, who am I thinking of? Who's the closer that I'm thinking of that I thought they were going to bring in? Yeah, Trevor Bauer is the starting pitcher. I'm thinking of somebody, and now I'm drawing a blank on who was going to be the thing. Anyway, appreciate you, Bob. Appreciate you. Always looking out for me. So anyway, let's look at some of these futures real quick. So you got Philly's win total. Philly's win total. 89 and a half. I think that is an easy one. I think the fighting Phils definitely win over 89 and a half. You got, we talked about this yesterday. Phillies won 90 games last year. 90 games. And that's starting 25 and 30. They, so as long as they don't have another terrible start, because you go back to 2022, they had they started 21 and 29, and then they fired Girardi. Then you got 2023. They start 25 and 30, and then they went on and played 600 baseball. This team, with this pitching staff, with this lineup, should play 600 baseball all season long. So you win, 
you play 600 baseball, you're winning 98 games. So I'm definitely going over 89 and a half. I actually think the fighting Phils win 100 games this year. I think they're going to be motivated. I think they're going to come out. I think they're going to come out a lot quicker than they did last. Last year, they started 0-4. They lost all four games to start the season, and then they went 25-30. and 30. So I got them definitely winning over 89 and a half. But I have them winning 100. Flexing and stepping saying they're not winning 100. I'm telling you, man, if they just play 600 baseball, I know I say just, but if they play 600 baseball all year, which is what they did for 107 games last year, that's 100 wins. Atlanta's over-under is 101 and a half. So, you look at last season, Braves won 104 games. Won the NL East by 14 games. Mr. Rudy Poo says they were motivated last year, and they got dog-walked in game six and seven at Citizens Bank Park. Blind optimism is wild with Bill. Dude, it was ugly last year, Rudy Pooh. The fact that they let the Diamondbacks win three games and two of them in Citizens Bank Park was ridiculous. Bats went cold. Stars didn't show up. It was bad. But I just think this team, it just feels different to me. What's coming out of spring training, what you're hearing them say, how they're approaching the season, to me, it just feels different. So we'll see what happens. But let's look at some more futures here because we talked about the Phil's team awards. Let's look at the individual awards for a second. And Xander, my producer, who's a big Phillies fan, he's good with 90-plus wins. Just show up come playoff time is what he's saying. I just don't know how much we can keep asking this team to be a wild card team and then beat the Braves or the Dodgers, because they're probably going to have to get through one, if not both of those teams in the postseason, and do it as the road team a majority of the time. So I think we need to win the NL East. I think the Phillies need to win the NL East this year. I know that they've proven you just have to get in. I get it. You look at what the Diamondbacks did last year. You get hot at the right time, you can go all the way to the World Series. I just want to see them win the NL East. And they want to win the NL East. You listen to these players and what they're saying and what they're talking about, they also want to win the NL East. T.O. on TikTok, this team doesn't care about win, winning 100 games. They want to ring. I agree with you. But they also keep saying they want to win the NL East. That seems to me like it is a goal of this Phillies team coming out of spring training. Gary Williams. We beat the Braves when it mattered. Yes, we did. Muffin. The Snakes are the best team in the Major League Baseball right now. I don't know if I agree with you on that one, dude. I don't know about that. But let's look at some of these individual awards for Major League Baseball and where Phillies line up. So Bryce Harper has the fifth best odds to win the MVP for the National League. You think that's a possibility? He's plus 1,100. There's the four players in front of him. Mookie Betts from the Dodgers. Ronald Acuna Jr. from the Braves. Shohei Otani from the Dodgers. Freddie Freeman from the Dodgers. How crazy is that? Dodgers have three of the top four favorites to win the National League MVP. That's absurd. But Bryce Harper, fifth best. Now, listen to this one. This one's interesting to me. Trey Turner, 12th best. 12th best odds at plus 2,500. And I know people are saying about the Diamondbacks putting up 14 runs and all that. But it's one game. I'm not going to sit here and say they're the best team in baseball because of that. But pretty impressive stuff. But what do you think? You think Trey Turner at plus 2,500 has a shot to win the MVP? Not a bad bet. So he's got the 12th best odds. Cy Young winners for the National League.
Spencer Strider and Zach Wheeler, one and two, both going up against each other at 3 o'clock. How awesome is that? Your two favorites to win the Cy Young in the National League. Opening day starters today, Braves and Phillies. So you got Spencer Strider at plus 400, Zach Wheeler at plus 800. Aaron Nola, plus 2,000. He has the 10th best odds to win the Cy Young. But here's the play for me. Ranger Suarez, plus 10,000 to win the Cy Young. Yeah, that's worth it. That's worth taking a shot, isn't it? With Ranger? I mean, look, likelihood that it's going to hit is crazy. But the odds are so damn good. Ranger Suarez has the 34th best odds to be your NL Cy Young winner. But plus 10,000, that's worth a $100 bet. I think Ranger's going to have a good season. Now, whether or not he wins the Cy Young, that maybe is a stretch. But I do think Ranger's going to have a good season. Another interesting one, Trey Turner. Over under 40 home runs is plus 1,000. So he's never done it before. Closest he's ever got was 2021. He had 28 home runs, but that may not be another bad little $100 bet. Slagger says you're better off playing the lottery. So when we get back, that was our some Phillies talk. When we get back, I want to talk about this Ivan Fedotov thing with the Philadelphia Flyers. We'll talk about some Sixers, and then we'll talk a little. I know some people want to talk Eagles draft, so we'll get into it a little bit. So this is the Philly Sports Power Hour. We'll be right back. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian. In my heart, I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA. And the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles.
What's up, everybody? Welcome back into the Philly Sports Power Hour with Bill Calarulo. Taking you all the way up to 11 o'clock today. Hope everybody has a great weekend planned. Easter weekend. Today is Good Friday. So if you abide by that, no meat today. Some people, my producer, you don't eat a lot today either. It's a, it's a day of fasting if you follow all that. But hopefully everybody has a great Easter weekend. If you celebrate, I got a little brunch planned on uh, Sunday. I got to be on the radio until 12, and then I got to rush over to do uh, to do brunch with the kids, Easter egg hunt, all the fun stuff. So hopefully everyone's got a great weekend planned. But today is opening day. We spent a lot of time talking to Fight and Phil's this morning. But let's switch gears for a second because there's something else that I am ecstatic about right now in Philadelphia that I did not think, did not think this was going to happen. We were just talking about it a little bit on TikTok during the break. I was upset, and I said this earlier this week, that I was upset that the Flyers didn't make a move for a backup goalie at the trade deadline. I was upset that every single time Sam Erson had a sit whether it was a back-to-back or what have you, that it was almost a guaranteed loss for the Flyers because Peterson stunk, Felix Sandstrom's not the answer. And then somehow, out of nowhere, the news drops yesterday that Ivan Fedotov's contract with the KHL has been terminated. And then we're thinking, well, is he coming? Is he coming to the Flyers? And now it is formally announced that Ivan Fedotov is here in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes when this show is over. They're going to have a press conference. Danny Briere and Ivan Fedotov. And if you don't know who Ivan Fedotov is, he's a 6'7 goalie that the Flyers drafted in 2015. No one thought we had given up hope because he was supposed to come here a couple years ago. And then he allegedly got arrested by Russia. He had to join the military. I don't know what the hell happened. We only hear the news coming out of Russia. We didn't know what was going to happen. It didn't look like this guy was coming. And now all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he's here. He is freaking here. The Flyers just announced it. In 44 games this season, Fedotov in Russia, 2.37 goals against, and over 914 save percentage. 6-7. <laughs> I can't wait to see this guy in a Flyers uniform. And you got to give credit. You have to give credit. Danny Briere, in his first season as general manager for the Philadelphia Flyers, has operated like a freaking ninja in the night. The whole Cutter Gauthier crap, if you remember that, the whole Cutter Gauthier, no one knew that any of that was going on until the trade happens for Jamie Drysdale. Nobody knew. We didn't know Cutter Gauthier didn't want to play in Philadelphia. We didn't know that they were talking to other teams about trading him. And then, boom, it's done. And now, I'm assuming Danny Briere and the Flyers organization had to know that this was going on. They had to know that this was going on, and now he's here today, and the first we heard about it was yesterday afternoon. And in addition to Ivan Fedotov, Alexei Kolosov is also apparently headed here. Now, he's in Belarus, I believe. So now we had a team where we're like, oh, I've been complaining, lacking goaltending depth, and now all of a sudden you got Fedotov and Kolosov in a week. I know not everyone are Flyers fans, but this is exciting. This is really exciting. And the Flyers need it because they are in a playoff push down the stretch. They lost last night, a frustrating loss to the Montreal Canadiens, a game that they should not lose. They just went through their gauntlet of a stretch where they played a lot of tough teams. And they went 2-3-2. and two. They now have six games against teams who are not in playoff contention. And they lost the first one last night. 
So there's now nine games left. Excuse me, eight games left. Only eight games left. Thankfully, the Capitals lost last night and the Detroit Red Wings lost last night. So they still remain a point up on the Capitals, but the Capitals have two games in hand. Every single point matters right now. Flyers are back in action on Saturday at home against the Chicago Blackhawks. Connor Bedard's in town, rookie goal leader. But last night was a tough one. Flyers will go down 2-0. They actually scored two goals in the third period. Both of them were overturned, and they were the right calls. First one, uh, Garnet Hathaway kicks it in. Second one, Tyson Forrester's offsides. So close, but offsides. But it is an exciting time to be a Flyers fan. So we'll see what shakes there. And then you talk about players coming over, players coming and joining this Flyers team. Well, how about Joel Embiid? Looks like he's coming back. We've been waiting for this. We've been debating this. Now, all the news was good coming from Nick Nurse that they were optimistic that things were looking good, that he was trending in the right direction. But then it's now reported he travels with the team to Cleveland. You don't travel if you're not close to playing. They usually don't bring injured players. And then in addition to that, the Sixers put out a tweet yesterday and it was one of those gifts of Joel Embiid just eating an apple. I don't know what the hell it meant, but they're obviously teasing something. So you got Joel Embiid potentially coming back. I don't know if it's going to be tonight. They're in Cleveland tonight. They're in Toronto on Sunday. But why would he travel if he wasn't coming back? Why would the Sixers put out that tweet if he wasn't coming back? And I see flexing and stepping saying he loves my faith in the Sixers. Twiz isn't buying the Sixers stock. Flexing saying I'm not giving up. <laughs> Reyes wants me, wants me to let the Sixers die. Here's why I'm not giving up hope on the Sixers. Just, just hear me out. Just hear me out. Okay. I understand that it is not very likely that the Sixers do anything. I understand the pessimism. I'm not saying that it is likely that they go on a run. However, the reason I'm not giving up hope is that Joel Embiid is literally the best player in the NBA. So if you've taken the best player, the MVP, and you remove him from any team in the NBA, they're going to struggle. So, of course, the Sixers were going to struggle without Joel Embiid. Of course. But the reason why I'm not losing hope is because not only are you getting Embiid back, you're now adding him to a team that we've never seen him play with. Now, I get it. That could be a negative, too, because how does he gel with all these new guys? But you're adding Joel Embiid to a Sixers team we have literally never seen him play with. We've never seen Joel Embiid play with Kyle Lowry. We've never seen Joel Embiid play with Buddy Heald and campaign. We only saw Joel play with Kelly Oubre for a very short time. And we certainly didn't see Joel play with Kelly Oubre when Oubre was playing at the level he's been playing for like the last 13, 14 games. So the way I look at it is, I get it. I'm not saying that it's likely they go on a run, but I also am not just ready to wave the white flag and say, ah, I'm not even going to watch the Sixers. Because it is exciting to think about Joel Embiid with Tyrese Maxey, Kelly Oubre, Kyle Lowry. I know Tobias is still on this team, unfortunately. But maybe they can do something. And I thought Nick Nurse said something very interesting earlier in the week. He talked about his 2019 Toronto Raptors team that went on to win the NBA championship. They had played with each other for 56 minutes. 56 minutes before the playoffs. And then they went on that tear. And we all remember it. 
Kawhi shot that knocked the Sixers out of the playoffs. And Flexen and Stepin saying, but there's no Kawhi on this team. But you do have Joel Embiid, Flexen. And I know you're saying he's not Kawhi, but we also never saw Joel Embiid playing at the level he was playing before he got hurt this year. And we've never seen Joel Embiid in the playoffs with Nick Nurse as his coach. So I'm not saying it's likely that the Sixers do anything. But I'm also just not ready to give up hope when you're literally adding the NBA MVP back to your squad. And this is probably the deepest bench he's ever had. So just, I think we should be a little excited. That's all I'm saying. I think we should be a little excited. I know, lower our expectations. I'm not saying that they're going to be able to get through Boston necessarily. But you got a lot of factors here where maybe we shouldn't. Where we shouldn't say, hey, you know what? It's over. I'm done. I'm done. So just bear with me on it. But that's a big question mark. I know what they can do. Well, let's talk about some other question marks. Let's jump over to the Philadelphia Eagles. Because one of the big questions, I know everybody's ready to start talking about the draft. Everybody wants the draft to get here. So right now, Philadelphia Eagles, I'm looking at it. They have the 22nd overall pick in the first round. They still have the 50th in the second. That's from New Orleans. The 53rd in the second. That's their own. They have the... Did they trade the 97th overall pick? Didn't they? Did they move down with that third pick? Is that the one they gave up? And then they moved to 120, I think, with uh, the Steelers. Let me just say, I think that's the one they moved off from. They they did have the 97th, but I think they moved to 120. Yeah. So they moved down on that one in the Kenny Pickett trade. They went from the 97th pick in the third round to the 120th pick in the fourth round. So we'll see how it shakes. But the big question is, what do they take at 22? I know a lot of people are saying, hey, would they go corner? Would they go corner? If you follow me, you follow this show, you know that the one area where I didn't care if they addressed it in free agency on defense was corner. That was the one area where I said, hey, look, I'm okay with the cornerback room the way it is right now in free agency. I have a little bit different opinion when it comes to the draft because I actually wouldn't mind them drafting a corner at 22nd overall. I wouldn't I wouldn't hate that because Slay is getting up there. I'm okay this year. I was okay with Slay and Ringo, and you know I like Isaiah Rogers, who's hopefully going to get reinstated. Eli Ricks is going to battle. They're bringing back Zach McPherson from his Achilles tear. But I would be okay if they took a first-round draft pick if they think they found a sure thing at corner. I know a lot of people want Nate Wiggins out of Clemson. Small, only 185 pounds, but extremely talented. ton of skills. So I'd be okay with it. But I think the more likely move that the Philadelphia Eagles are going to do, I think it's going to be an offensive lineman. I know that's not the sexy pick. I know everybody hears offensive line, they go, ah, oh. but that probably is a smart move for the Philadelphia Eagles. It probably is a smart move for them to take an offensive line. Now, Brock, hold on, because William Stark says something that I would absolutely love. So William Stark on tick on uh, YouTube, TikTok can't see it. William Stark says. Draft Brock Bowers, the tight end out of Georgia. Now, Brock Bowers, there's potential that he's off the board before it even gets to the to the Eagles. But I would absolutely love for them to take a tight end. We know, and you probably have heard before, when they drafted Dallas Goddard in the second round, Zach Ertz was older than Goddard is right now. When they drafted Zach Ertz, Dallas Goddard is older than Brent Selleck was right now. So the fact that they could take a tight end is not completely out of the realm of possibility. 
I don't know if they would use a first round draft pick at 22, but could maybe a tight end be available in the second round at 50? Would they trade up to get one? I don't think Brock Bowers would be available. There's another good tight end out of Texas, Jatavian Sanders, who's raw, but looks like he's got a lot of talent. But the the Sixers, I'm still on my Sixers talk. The Eagles absolutely need a better tight end. I'm not even, I'm not talking about Dallas Goddard. I love Dallas Goddard, but they need a better tight end at tight end two. They absolutely need a better tight end at that second tight end position because right now they really don't have anybody. They still have Grant Calcaterra. They brought back Albert O. If you remember, Albert O, they made the move for in training camp last year when the Denver Broncos were about to move on. And Albert O, hold on, I have his stats here. So they traded a 2025 six-rounder to get Albert O and a seventh round back because it looked like Denver was just going to cut him. But this guy, 6'5", 258 pounds. His best season came in 2021. He played 14 games, 33 catches, 330 yards, two touchdowns. But then he only played eight games in 2022. And then 2023 with the Eagles last year, four games, 56 snaps, zero catches. But the Eagles made it a point to bring him back. So he had just finished his final year of his rookie deal. Eagles re-signed him. So, and they made that a priority. They signed him before free agency hit. So is Albert O the answer at that second tight end position? I don't think he is. Could he potentially become the answer? Maybe, but it's a big maybe. And you know me with these freaking question marks. There's too many of them. But Brock Bowers, if he somehow falls to you at 22, which I don't think he would. Albert O flexing and stepping. Flex and stepping asking who? I don't even want to try to pronounce his last name, dude. You know who I'm talking about? Let me see if I could uh, say this name because it is. I keep calling him Albert O. Because it's Albert, I even have it written as Albert O. Flexing and Steppen says he's trash, so he knows who I'm talking about. I'm not even going to try to say his name. I I just call him Albert O. His name's way too hard, and I don't want to butcher it. I don't want to uh, offend the man. Because you know all the Eagles listen to this show. They don't listen to Big Sills, I don't think. I don't think they like what Big Sills has to say. Yeah, there we go. Dan Quan Barkley doing it phonetically for me. Albert Oku Ibunam. Good job, Dane Quan Barkley. You guys got my back today. Albert Oku Ibunam. Appreciate it. Flexen says they should listen to Big Sills. Big Sills. I still got to get my uh, my battle with Big Sills. But William Stark says, look at Goddard's history of being injured and being available. Yeah, that's why they need to upgrade that position. So I do expect them to upgrade that position, but could it be a guy like Brock Powers? I I don't think they'll get Brock Powers. I just don't think they'll get him out of Georgia. But, hey, if he falls, maybe. But I think if you're looking at the draft board and you're looking at the history of what the Philadelphia Eagles do, I would not be surprised if they go offensive line. And not only because, yes, Lane Johnson's getting up there, not only because with Jason Kelsey retiring and you move Cam Jurgens over to center, it leaves a hole at right guard, which maybe Tyler Steen can fill. They also lost Jack Driscoll. They lost Sua Opeta. You know they lost Isaac Sayamala last season. So the Philadelphia Eagles have been fairly fortunate over the last couple of seasons that they haven't had a lot of injuries along that offensive line. I know Jurgens missed a couple of games. Lane Johnson missed a couple of games, but they've been fairly fortunate to not have a lot of guys go down with injury. You need depth. So I think they probably go offensive line because you know Lane Johnson's not playing for much longer, maybe a couple of seasons. And this is a really deep draft class when it comes to offensive line. So there's a guy that some people really like who could play center or guard And that's Jackson Powers Johnson out of Oregon. He's a guy that could maybe be there when you you pick at 22. I think some of these other guys are going to be gone, like Joe Alt out of Notre Dame. He's going to be top 10, 
maybe top five. Booga out of Oregon State. Then you got these names are tough, man. Fashanu out of Penn State, young but is athletic. But could Jackson Powers Johnson be available? So we'll see. But I could see them going offensive line. And really, you look at the offense. There's we just talked about pretty much two of the three question marks. The offense is in pretty good shape. I told you tight end two to me is a question mark on the offense. Talked about right guard question mark. Is that going to be Tyler Steen? I think it is. We'll still see. But then there's a third question mark, which we didn't talk about, which I know some people would love if they drafted Xavier Worthy out of Texas. I don't think that's going to happen. But his stock is rising after his speed was shown at the combine. But that's another question mark. Wide receiver three. But if you listen to Nick Sirianni, I know he was a tough listen at the owners' meetings. But if you listen to Nick Sirianni, he's high on Paris Campbell. They liked Paris Campbell in Indianapolis when Sirianni was there as the coach. And obviously the Eagles liked him because they considered drafting him. So is he the answer at wide receiver three? We know they also signed Devontae Parker. But those are the questions right now. If you look at the offense, offense is in pretty good shape. I mean, that's an understatement with all the weapons that they have. But the question marks are, who's your wide receiver three? Who's your right guard? Who's your second tight end? I think they're very high on Kenny Gainwell. Sirianni made it a point to talk about Gainwell. So they're still high on him as your backup running back to Saquon. So whether or not they do anything to add pieces to compete at wide receiver three, I know they like some of these guys they have on these future contracts. But those are really the only question marks. Now, on defense, you know I still think there are a lot of question marks. None bigger than the whole Hassan Reddick situation, which we still don't have an answer on. And I'm not going to feel good about Reddick being here until we get through the draft and, and we hear something. Because I know there are a lot of people saying, hey, the longer this goes, the more likely it is that Reddick's back. Not unless they redo his deal. There's no way you could ask this guy to come back on his current contract. We've talked about it at length. I know there's some of you who say, hey, he's under contract. He should just play. I disagree. The guy's severely underpaid. But the good thing is, the longer this goes, what it signals to me is there's no team out there that's willing to give Reddick what he wants, which maybe makes it a possibility he comes back to the Eagles and says, okay, this is what teams are willing to give me. This is what I'll take. And then the Eagles decide to keep him because I'd love for them to keep him. And I think all of you agree with me. And we talked about it. A lot of the moves they make signal, hey, they're all in this year. Hey, we're going all in. Well, if you're going all in this year, how does trading Hassan Reddick help you? It doesn't. It doesn't help you at all, in my opinion, because you're not getting. I saw someone, someone tweet yesterday, oh, the Eagles should trade Reddick to the Baltimore Ravens for the 30th overall pick. You are not getting a first-round draft pick for Hassan Reddick. You're not even getting a second-rounder. Not when a team's going to have to pay him a bunch of money. We talked about this. The Eagles will be lucky to get a third-round draft pick. That doesn't help me this year. If you're going all in this season with the guys you have, that doesn't help me. So they got to keep Redick. I still think they need to do something at linebacker because right now your starters are Devin White and the Kobe Dean. Could be good. Big emphasis on could be. So that's why I still like to see a little bit more of a sure thing at linebacker. Same thing at safety. Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, and then what? Reed Blankenship, injury-prone, up-and-down play. Not giving up on Reed, but can you really go into this season with Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, Reed Blankenship, and Sidney Brown, who we don't even know if he's going to be healthy this year with the torn ACL? So a lot of question marks. Another big question mark, and we'll see how this all plays out, is Brandon Ayuk in San Francisco. Because, you know, he was a first-round draft pick in 2020. Devontae Smith was a first-round draft pick in 2021. So the Eagles will exercise his fifth-year option and then hopefully enter into a new deal before he plays 
on his final fifth-year deal, but you still have Devontae for two seasons. So the Eagles don't have to worry about what's going on in San Francisco right now, which is Brandon Ayuk is entering that final year of his deal, his fifth-year option year. He wants a new deal. And he just came out and said, hey, I just want to be paid like I'm worth. So that could be interesting because the 49ers are not in a great spot when it comes to salary cap. So could they lose Brandon Ayuk? They lose Brandon Ayuk. That is a major, major loss. Major loss for the 49ers. And I see Paul Mancini saying, Reddick's from Camden slash Haddon Heights, not North Philly. I think why they say North Philly, Paul, is because he played at Temple. So, yeah, he born in Camden, played Haddon Heights High School, but then went to North Philly and played at Temple. So I think that's why people say North Philly. Anyway, we're going to end the Power Hour like we do every day with a little Today in Sports History. This is a great one for Eagles fans. March 29th, 1994 was the day Jimmy Johnson quit the Dallas Cowboys. He had enough of Jerry Jones's BS, and it was today, back in 1994, where Jimmy Johnson said, I'm done. I'm out of here. And it was billed as a mutual parting of ways. And then Barry Switzer, who was on with Big Seals yesterday, took over Jimmy Johnson's team and did win a Super Bowl two years later. And then that was it. After that, Jerry's world and them boys haven't even been back to a championship game. Haven't even got to a championship game. But it was today, March 29th, 1994, that Jimmy Johnson said, how about them Cowboys, and walked out the door. But this was the Philly Sports Power Hour. Happy Easter to everybody who celebrates. If you want to check me out, you know where you can find me all weekend long. But I hope everybody has a great day. Enjoy opening day. Enjoy Easter weekend. And I'll see you back here Monday, 10 o'clock. I'm Bill Calarulo. That was the Philly Sports Power Hour. And as always, go Birds. 